Good evening, everyone. How are you all? Welcome to First Aid AMC MCQ free two week session. So tonight we are going to finish cardiology. That's the plan, right? So thank you for coming to the live sessions and finishing the, the two week sessions with us. I hope that you guys are enjoying it and learning the things that you need to pass your exam. Now, we have so far done few classes, so you must have an idea how the course is going to be and how the classes can be like. So if, you, if any of you who are new or you, we have taken class on psychiatry, so just one class, there will be some more class in the course. Then we also did a question solve tips and tricks. Then we started theory session. We did one cardiology session on Sunday and today we are going to do cardiology too, all right? And then you are going to have two more sessions with random question discussion that's coming in this week and next week. And then we will do a cardiology question solve class at the end of your two week session. So that will be the plan for two weeks free session. The course has already been started. So those of you who are already joined, you know that this is a part of your course as well. So please make sure you, you join the sessions and finish what we are doing. Okay. So in the last class, I discussed with you that how, how the preparation for cardiology should be taken and what are the resources that we should follow. So you, you must have an idea right now. So we mainly focused on chest pain in our last session, especially how to manage myocardial infarction. What are the different causes of chest pain in a patient. So we did discuss it in detail. Tonight we are focusing on heart failure, heart valvular disorders, hypertension, and some other random topics, okay? First of all, let's have a look again that how heart function is supposed to be so that you can remember that what is heart failure because we are going to focus on it. So let's have a look to this video again. A healthy heart, as seen here, beats approximately 60 to 100 times a minute, providing oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. The lower left chamber of the heart, called the left ventricle, is the main pumping chamber. There are many different conditions that can lead to congestive heart failure, including a prior heart attack, high blood pressure, and coronary artery disease. Any of these can prevent the heart from efficiently pumping blood to the rest of the body. As a result, the heart may beat faster and the ventricle may increase in size, becoming an even less effective pump. When the kidneys sense the reduced blood flow, they attempt to compensate by retaining more water and salt. This excess fluid retention often causes congestion in the tissues and results in swelling and an increased strain on an already weak heart. The progressive effect of the heart failing to properly circulate blood and congestion due to fluid retention is known as congestive heart failure. So, did you get an idea that how your all the symptoms of heart failure happens? So now I'm going to just discuss with you a little bit so that you can understand that why we are treating a patient with different medications for systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. So first of all, let's go through a little bit of the pathophysiology. So you guys remember about the heart function that we discussed in our first class on cardiology. So, and that's your pulmonary artery and that's your aorta, right? It'll be easier for you to understand if we just make it a little bit different color. Okay, so what we have found so far is that this is your superior vena cava, which brings the blood from your upper extremity and inferior vena cava brings blood from the lower extremities. 
and it brings the blood on your right atrium. And then it goes to your right ventricle through tricuspid valve. And then from right ventricle, through your pulmonary valve, it goes from your pulmonary artery into the lungs, right? From lungs, you got your pulmonary vein, which takes the oxygenated blood into your left atrium. And then through the mitral valve, blood will go to your left ventricle. And then through your, palm, through your aortic valve, the blood will goes the blood will go into the aortic or or into your aorta and from aorta throughout the whole body so that's how the heart function is supposed to happen now what happens in congestive cardiac failure that two two things can happen one that your left ventricle can have difficulty to pump blood into the aorta so if there is, let's say that there is lots of hypertension or there is increased pressure on the aorta, so your left ventricle will struggle to push blood into the aorta, right? And on the way to do that, your left ventricle will start to build muscle so that it can push more blood. But when it does that, it also loses its elasticity and gradually it becomes weaker because the the muscle become the muscle lose its elasticity. So as it loses elasticity, it cannot push harder. So when it cannot push harder, your heart fails happen. And that is what we call a systolic heart failure when heart pumping action is impaired. Okay. Now let's say someone has got left, left heart failure because the left ventricle is getting full of blood. What will happen then? Blood will then try to go to the backward. So it will then accumulate in left atrium. Left atrium will get dilated. At one point, it will not be able to hold enough blood. Okay? And then the blood will go to your lungs. So what will happen to the lungs? That patient will develop pulmonary edema because now, because of back, backflow of blood and fluid, into the lung, patient now develops fluid accumulation into the lungs, which is what we call as pulmonary edema. And patient in, the, in this situation will have orthopnea, which means that when they lie down, because of gravity, all the fluid now gets into the lung and patient starts breathing difficulty, especially during sleeping. And they will often say that I need to use more than one pillow at night, because if they use more pillow, then the gravity no longer works and they feel better. So that's orthopnea, one finding. These patients, because of pulmonary edema, when you check their lung, you will also get bivasilar precipitation. And that's actually just the fluid that you can hear through auscultation. So this is the main feature of left heart failure, orthopnea and bivasilar precipitation. Now, at one point of time, the lung will become overloaded and it will start to push pressure or because there will be more and more backflow of blood, the pressure inside your pulmonary artery then will become higher. Now, because pulmonary artery pressure is high, your right ventricle now needs more and more push to send blood into the pulmonary artery. So what happens to the right ventricle then? Same thing like left ventricle, Right ventricle starts to get thickened, and that's what we call as right ventricular hypertrophy. And at one point, right ventricle also fails. And when right ventricle fails, there will be pushing of blood to the right atrium, and right atrium becomes overloaded, and then it push blood to your extremities. So if there is superior vena cava now becoming congested, then you get raised JVP. If because of inferior vena cava getting congested, you get ankle edema or pedal edema. Same because of that, you get hepatic congestion because the hepatic vein and artery gets congested. Because of that, you get tender hepatomegaly. You can also get ascites. So right heart failure, basically, these are the main features that you will get. 
raised JVP, pedal edema, tender hepatomegaly, and sometimes ascites. So basically, what is the commonest cause of right heart failure? Left heart failure, because left heart failure eventually become right heart failure and it causes the congestive cardiac failure. Is this clear for everyone that what I'm trying to say? Great, very good. So now you know what is systolic heart failure. That means the heart is not able to pump blood into the aorta. So what is diastolic heart failure? Diastolic heart failure means that diastole means your heart needs to be relaxed. If your heart can get relaxed like this, then it can take more blood in from the vena cavus now, if the heart loses that capacity to be relaxed, that's what we call as diastolic heart failure. There are conditions in which the heart muscle relaxation will be impaired. Like if a patient has got constrictive pericarditis, if a patient has got pericardial effusion, some other condition will come across that can, that can also cause restriction of your heart relaxation. So if your heart cannot relax properly, Obviously, it cannot get filled properly. If it cannot get filled properly, it cannot push more blood into your body as well. So that's what we call as diastolic heart failure. Which one is more common? Systolic heart failure is more common. But again, diastolic heart failure, the management is a bit different than systolic. So we should know how to differentiate between these two. Now, coming to this question, a 60-year-old man presents to his primary care physician for several months of dyspnea on exertion, exercise intolerance, lower extremity swelling. Past history of sarcoidosis, on physical exam, he has raised JVP, eating edema in the lower extremity, and the echocardiogram shows an ejection fraction of 35%. The best way to differentiate between systolic and diastolic heart failure is the ejection fraction. Ejection fraction, basically, it looks into your cardiac output. And cardiac output means how much blood you can push into the aorta. So if cardiac output is low, ejection fraction will be low. And what causes more cardiac output, systole or diastole? Guys? Systole, right? So that means if ejection fraction is low, which means that systole is impaired, and that is what how we can find out if it is a systolic heart failure. So systolic heart failure, your ejection fraction will be lower than normal. And that's the time you can confirm that it is a case of systolic heart failure. There are two questions in here. One, if we have already read, in which patient having all the features of heart failure and ejection fraction 35%. The other case, 57 year old, having dyspnea, lower extremity edema, raised JVP, S4 heart sound, chest X-ray shows normal cardiac shadow. The echo shows a thickened left ventricle with an ejection fraction of 65%. It's even more than normal. So one is, Ejection fraction low, so that is your systolic heart failure. Where ejection fraction is normal, that's diastolic heart failure. Okay? Now, coming to the symptoms of heart failure as a summary. Because of fluid accumulation in congestive cardiac failure, everywhere fluid can get accumulated. So if fluid gets accumulated into the lung, patient develops shortness of breath and orthopnea. They can also get cough, especially at night. Fatigue, lethargy is a very common feature. If they accumulate fluid, then they will gain weight. Ankle edema, because of hepatic congestion, they can also get abdominal discomfort. And because there is not much of a blood that's going into your body, your brain is also not getting enough blood. And these patients can develop 
dizzy spell, syncope, weakness, fatigue. Now, we already discussed how to differentiate left heart failure and right heart failure. But to give you the idea that we know that left heart failure patient, basically they will have this finding. So especially you will get patient having bilateral basal crepitation. They will have orthopnea. You can also get a S3 gallop rhythm. That's the third heart sound. In right heart failure, these are the main features, elevated JVP, ankle edema, tender hepatomegaly. Systolic versus diastolic heart failure. The classic heart failure is systolic failure due to inadequate pumping of the heart. In this case, the ventricle will be dilated and it will not contract properly and the ejection fraction will be less than 40%. That means above 40% ejection fraction is usually, we, we can say it's normal. What is diastolic heart failure? Diastolic heart failure is an impairment of left ventricular feeling with preserved systolic function. That means the contraction of the heart is fine, but the feeling is not good. That means relaxation is impaired. It should be suspected in the elderly patient with hypertension and a normal heart size on chest X-ray because in this case, in diastolic heart failure, heart doesn't get dilated like systolic heart failure. In systolic heart failure, heart gets dilated, okay? And then sometimes you can get cardiomegaly on chest X-ray. In diastolic heart failure, heart cannot get dilated, right? That's the main problem. So your chest X-ray, there will be no cardiomegaly. So any elderly patient, cardiomegaly, there is no cardiomegaly on X-ray, but presenting with dyspnea on exertion or thopnea, we should suspect diastolic heart failure. Now, we also call that in case of systolic heart failure, because it is the loss of contractile function of the myocardium, these patients will have a decrease in ventricular emptying. So ventricle will be full with blood and it cannot empty it. What are the classic cause of systolic heart failure? Especially if a patient develops myocardial infarction and because of myocardial infarction, part of the heart muscle will become fully weak, right? So that's what happens in heart attack. So let's say that this artery is completely blocked. So this part of the heart muscle is not getting any blood supply. So this muscle is not strong anymore. And that's what we call as ischemic cardiomyopathy. So patient who has got ischemic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, they can develop systolic heart failure. Diastolic heart failure, also known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Okay, we know what it is and mainly caused by sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, anything which causes restriction of the heart relaxation. Causes. So what are the causes of heart failure? In systolic heart failure, we are mainly looking for ischemic heart disease, previous myocardial infarction, that's the most common cause, and also hypertension. Diastolic heart failure can be due to a lot of causes, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, could be also ischemic heart disease, aortic stenosis, atrial fibrillation. So a lot of causes are there, which you can go through. Coming to investigations. So right now you know how to diagnose heart failure. You know what are the difference between right heart failure, left heart failure. You know what is systolic and diastolic heart failure. So if you suspect a patient to have a heart failure, what will be your initial investigation? Anyone? That's the wrong answer. I know that all of you will choose echocardiogram. Think about basic thing always. In your hospital, if a patient comes to you with any heart symptom, even if it is a heart failure, 
will you do echocardiogram straight away or will you just start with the ECG first? You will always do an ECG first. That's what exam does in your, in your case. Because why we do the ECG? A patient who presents to you with a sudden worsening of heart failure, it could be just underlying myocardial infarction is causing it. We should always look for a suspected ischemic heart disease or MI, or even any kind of arrhythmia conduction abnormality can cause heart failure. So your initial investigation is always an ECG. And then if the question asks you, what is your definitive investigation or what is your most appropriate investigation, that's echocardiogram. So question will, will be like this, okay? So echocardiogram is the investigation of choice. It will tell you how is the ejection fraction. And based on that, you can confirm that if it is a systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure. We can do chest X-ray, but chest X-ray is just an adjunct or kind of an additional investigation. It will not add, many, add too much in your diagnosis or management, okay? A lot of time, you will also get a option called BNP. BNP is B-type natriuretic peptide. This is a hormone which is secreted from the ventricular myocardium. If a patient develops heart failure, BNP is done to check the progress of heart failure. It is never done as an investigation of choice to diagnose heart failure. But if the question asks you that the echocardiogram is not available for making the diagnosis, what else you can do? Yes, in that case, we can do BNP because this is just a blood test, which, can, which will be elevated if it is a heart failure. But as an investigation of choice, if echo is available, we will always choose echo. BNP, basically we do like, let's say we have diagnosed a patient with heart failure. If we want to check the progression of heart failure, then we will do BNP. So we know how to diagnose. Echo is the test of choice to confirm the diagnosis and also to classify the type of heart failure. Management. How we are going to manage a patient with heart failure? Now, this is not acute pulmonary edema management. If a patient presents to you with acute pulmonary edema, in which patient is severely short of breath, having orthopnea, and the saturation is going down, that's a different kind of management. In that case, you need to admit the patient to hospital, put the patient in propped up position. If oxygen is less than 94, start oxygen. If the patient was on any IV fluid, stop it, okay? Restrict the fluid for one liter per day, and then start the patient with diuretics, which is frusamide, okay? And based on how the patient progress, the management will be different, but this is how we start the treatment for acute pulmonary edema. Now, let's talk about if a patient is having heart failure, not a pulmonary edema, how we are going to start the treatment. The first line treatment for systolic heart failure, if the patient is not congested, is ACE inhibitor. So ACE inhibitor is your first line medication, but frusemide is only needed if a patient is having condition. Like, especially we say that frusemide should be added if a patient developing pulmonary edema-like feature, especially orthopnea, or shortness of breath. And if you get like a basal crepitations on lung auscultation, that's the time frusemide is must. So the stepwise approach for systolic heart failure management is initially start with ACE inhibitor, not controlled, then you add frusemide, still not controlled, add spironolactone, still not controlled, you can add selective beta blocker only if a patient is uvolemic, we will come to that point. And the last option is digoxin. 
Digoxin nowadays, it's the last option. Unless we, re we don't have any choice, then we go for it. Okay. Now, anyone, any of you have an idea that there is one other medication nowadays we try rather than trying the digoxin for heart failure. That means you can say in severe heart failure, there is one other medication nowadays we use. Anyone have any idea? Very good, RNA. Yes, that's right. So RNA is one of the very important medication nowadays. It's commonly known as Entresto. So Entresto. That's a combination of Secubitril. Plus Velsartan. This is a new drug and we call it RNA because it's angiotensin receptor. I think it's a naprilysin inhibitor, okay? And that is actually a very good medication. What it does is that it decreases the ventricular hypertrophy because that's actually what happens in heart failure. Ventricle becomes hypertrophic and it also helps with cardiac remodeling. So it prevents the cardiac remodeling. It decreases ventricular hypertrophy, and that's how it usually helps. And also the Valsartan, we know that this is the ARB blocker, which inhibits the renin angiotensin system, which basically causes all the heart failure symptoms. So this is only indicated if you have tried ACE inhibitor, fusamide, spironolactone, and still the heart failure is not well managed. And if the ejection fraction is less than 35, then yes, we can start the patient with this entresto. So even before digoxin, this is the ideal choice. So digoxin is very rarely we will use anymore. So that's how you should think about. So first ACE inhibitor, frisamide, spironolactin, and then only add a beta blocker when patient is euvolini, that means if a patient having a decompensated heart failure, what, what does it mean? If a patient having symptoms of heart failure, that means difficulty breathing, patient getting fluid accumulation all over the body, that's decompensated heart failure. When it become compensated and patient is euvolinic, that means the weight the patient was gaining during accumulation of fluid, now after giving the diuretics, the weight is now again the same ideal body weight, then you can start the patient with a beta blocker, which will help with the cardiac remodeling as well. Never start beta blocker in a, in a decompensated heart failure patient, that means who is symptomatic, okay? So that's the management for systolic heart failure. When you start a patient with this medication, we should be very much careful about their electrolyte level, especially if you use ACE inhibitor and a spironolactone, both in the same patient, what it can do, anyone? Hyperkalemia, right? Because both ACE inhibitor and spironolactone, mm -hmm. they are potassium sparing drugs and it will cause hyperkalemia. So it's very important to make sure that we, you take the potassium in these patients especially. So that's the step-by-step -step approach. As you can see over here, we have already discussed that. You can look over here that about the beta blocker. Beta blocker is an important part of heart failure therapy. Along with ACE inhibitor, beta blocker have been demonstrated to decrease mortality, reduce hospitalization, improve functional class, and improve ejection fraction 
in these patients. So it has mortality benefit in heart failure treatment. Questions come, which one of the following has mortality benefit in heart failure patient? ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. Start patient on beta blocker after stabilization of symptoms with diuretic and ACE inhibitor. Okay. And it's a selective beta blocker, which means you can use metoprolol, atenolol, bisoprolol, or carvedilol. So that's all about the systolic heart failure management. Moving to diastolic heart failure. Diastolic heart failure has always some underlying cause. If you can treat the underlying cause, most likely heart failure will also get improved. So what are the cause? Hypertension, ischemia, or diabetes. Now, the treatment is different in here because your heart cannot get dilated, right? So what you can do to give some time for your heart to fill up, you will give some ionotropic agents such as calcium channel blocker or beta blocker. What's the reason, guys? Like what, what beta blocker or calcium channel blocker will do? It will decrease the heart rate. And if the heart rate is decreased, that means the contraction of the heart will be reduced. If contraction is reduced, your heart will get enough time to be filled. So that's the reason why we are going to give this beta blocker and calcium channel blocker in diastolic heart failure. On the other hand, if you give calcium channel blocker in a systolic heart failure patient, that heart failure will become much worse. So that's why it is very important to understand the difference between this systolic and diastolic heart failure. Same thing can save a patient life and can make it, make it worse if your diagnosis is wrong. All right? So you can't give some medications in diastolic heart failure. That means especially you can't give, you should not give diuretics. Why? Because diuretics will lose blood volume. That means your blood will, the fluid will be reduced from your body. So intravascular volume will be less. So if blood volume is low, your heart is already not feeling properly, and now you are removing the other fluid. That means there will be less amount of blood that goes into the heart, and your heart cannot relax on the other hand. So it will just make it worse. So diuretics should not be used unless patient is congested. Same with digoxin. Any vasodilators, especially nitrogen, anything which causes peripheral vasodilation should not be used in diastolic heart failure because you need to have more blood that goes into the heart so that it can have enough filling. So vasodilator that will pull blood into the lower extremity or into the leg. So it, again, it cannot send blood to your heart. Diuretics, it causes loss of blood or loss of fluid. So we say that anything which causes either reduction of blood volume or causes peripheral pooling of blood should not be used in diastolic heart failure. Okay, so I say that calcium channel blocker should not be used in a systolic heart failure patient. Why? Anyone? What's the reason? In systolic heart failure, the problem is with the contraction of the heart. Now, if you give calcium channel blocker, it will reduce the heart rate. Now, the problem is that systolic heart failure patient already having less cardiac output, right? Now, if you lower the heart rate, it will, it will get a lot worse. So that's why we should not give calcium channel blocker in a patient who has systolic heart failure. But in case of diastolic heart failure, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker is your choice. Is this clear for everyone that why we are giving different kinds of medication in these two kinds of heart failure? So you can see that ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, and spironolactone, these are the three medications which can improve survival in congestive cardiac failure patients. 
So that's all about heart failure. We will go a little bit about the pulmonary edema that we discussed. You know that pulmonary edema develops when there is accumulation of fluid into the lungs. Pulmonary edema, basically when you find out patient having orthopnea, shortness of breath on exertion, and they're also having bivasilar crepitation, then you think about pulmonary edema. If you do a chest X-ray in this patient, it will look like this. What you see in this case is that you can see that heart shadow is enlarged, obviously, so that's a cardiomegaly. On the top of that, this patient has got fluid accumulation in the lungs, and you will get this bat wing appearance of, of the lung shadow. It looks like this. If you see it like this, like we call it bat wing appearance of bilateral lung shadow. So this is mainly because of fluid accumulation in, into the interstitium of the lung. And that's the reason it, it becomes fully white like this. Okay, let's go a little bit backwards. Some of the side effects of the medications that we use in heart failure comes frequently in the exam. What are those? You need to know the basic or the most important side effect of some of the common medication. It's very important, like pharmacologic is, we say that a lot of questions come from here. So especially the common medication side effect, you should know. So about the thiazide diuretics, which is basically we use hydrochlorothiazide. The complication it can do, it can lower the sodium, potassium, but it can increase calcium, so hypercalcemia, hyperuricemia. So excess uric acid can cause gout. So again, we are very much cautious about giving thiazide diuretics in a patient who has gout. It can cause agranulocytosis, it can cause glucose intolerance. So we are also cautious of giving thiazide diuretics in a patient who has diabetes because it can increase the blood sugar level. Indapamide is same like thiazide diuretics, side effects are more or less same. But very important to remember that indapamide, classic questions come in the exam that a 90, 90 year old patient presents to you with a sudden onset confusion. He was started with indapamide because of his blood pressure or also heart failure. Now, after starting the medication, patient became confused. What's the cause? Cause is indapamide induced hyponatremia. Okay, so be very careful about these kind of questions. Next is loop diuretics, which is frusamide or bumetanide. Frusamide it causes everything low, which means hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, metabolic alkalosis. Very important to remember, it can cause nephritis, like interstitial nephritis and autotoxicity, okay? Then we have a spironolactone. This is the potassium sparing diuretics, which means it causes hyperkalemia, and also very commonly asked that gynecomastia. So spironolactone is the most common cause of gynecomastia as part of drug. What else can cause gynecomastia if a patient is on digoxin? So you should remember this too because it comes frequently in exam. Now, digoxin is no longer a very commonly used medication, so we don't bother with that too much. Only remember, if a patient is on digoxin, how to know that the patient develops any kind of side effects. The side effect of digoxin is most commonly nausea, vomiting, blurring of vision. They can also develop a yellow halo around the objects. And digoxin can cause almost any kind of arrhythmia. So they can develop paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, very commonly PVC, which is 
premature ventricular complex. They can develop bradycardia, heart block. So almost every kind of arrhythmia can happen in a patient with digoxin. If you suspect a patient having digoxin toxicity, the first thing that you do is stop the drug. Then you do the digoxin level. Sometimes digoxin level can be normal. Still patient can have toxic feature. So digoxin level is not the best thing to confirm toxicity. Is the symptom which will help you to say that it is, it is causing toxicity or not. What else we can do? There is a antidote for this, which we call DZ-bind. So you can use DZ-bind if a patient having acute digoxin toxicity. That's the antidote for it. Now, question for you. What digoxin actually do? Digoxin, it decreases the it decrease the heart rate. Okay. And most importantly, you can see that digital is have a look. So because it's an ionotrop, it inhibits the sodium potassium pump which causes increased intracellular sodium and decreased calcium. So if there is less calcium in the, intra, in the cell, what will happen? It will cause intracellular concentration of calcium will go higher and it results in improved cardiac contractility. So basically what happens that if you remember your cellular activity, if this is the sodium potassium pump, it will inhibit this pump. What is supposed to happen that the sodium and potassium exchange should happen with this pump. Okay. As a normal pump, sodium is supposed to go inside the cell and calcium is supposed to go outside the cell. Now that the pump is not working, more and more calcium is inside the cell because the calcium is not coming out. So if there is more intracellular calcium, calcium causes more contractility. So it increases the contractility of the heart, okay? But it can, on the other hand, it can decrease the heart rate. But basically you should remember that it increases the contraction of the heart. That's why sometimes in systolic heart failure, digoxin has some role. But it's still, because of its side effect, we try not to use it. One of the other important thing is that digoxin and potassium use the same receptor to go inside the cell. Okay, so try to understand it because it will help you with a lot of confusion. The same receptor will be used by digoxin and potassium to go inside the cell. Now, let's say your body has more digoxin or you're, you're given more digoxin than usual. When there is more digox digoxin, potassium cannot go inside the cell. More and more digoxin will get attached with this receptor and that will go, go into your cell. So digoxin will go into the cell. What will happen to the potassium? Now potassium is outside. That means in your blood. What you will get? You will develop hyperkalemia. Okay, so patient will develop hyperkalemia in that situation. Exactly opposite will happen if a patient has high potassium or hyperkalemia, then more and more potassium will go into the cell. What will happen to the digoxin? More and more digoxin in the blood and the patient can develop digoxin toxicity. So that's why we say hypokalemia, okay? Sorry, hyperkalemia will cause digoxin toxicity.
Okay. Just remember that because sometimes question can ask you different kind of things from here. Now, if you know how to, like how this works, you will never get confused. Is this clear for everyone? Good, brilliant. You guys are doing really good. I'm happy. Okay, now, few other advanced treatment is there for severe heart failure patient. And one of them, especially we say that if a patient has got dilated cardiomyopathy with the ejection fraction less than 35%, this patient has a highest risk of sudden cardiac death from cardiac arrest or, or ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. So for a patient who has got dilated cardiomyopathy with ejection fraction less than 35, you can actually go for this AICD. This is a automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Okay. And if patient goes into any kind of like a severe arrhythmia, like tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia or VF, this defibrillator will defibrillate the patient and will bring down the this severe possibility of cardiac arrest, okay? So this is one of the important things that we should remember. It comes in exam. We were talking about pulmonary edema, that pulmonary edema means there is more and more fluid accumulation in the lungs, and it's a medical emergency because if there is more fluid in the lungs, the gas exchange will be impaired and patient will have respiratory failure and it can be life threatening. And you know about the bad wing appearance now. We also know the symptoms and signs. The management we discussed a little bit, oxygen, propped up position, diuretic is the main treatment, which is the frusamide. Patient with pulmonary edema can become quite, con quite anxious to reduce their anxiety or respite, especially to reduce their anxiety. Sometimes we use morphine. Patient should be in upright position. You can give nitroglycerin to reduce the ventricular feeling. Sometimes ACE inhibitors, digoxin can be given, but it's not important for your exam. Yeah, so long-term use of digoxin can cause toxicity in any way. So that's why we don't like digoxin anymore. And it's, it's a real pain in the ass. You will need to check the digoxin level every now and then. Patient always needs some kind of follow-up. Either you need to do ECG every few, few weeks or months. You need to check the blood. So it's a lot of trouble. And nowadays, we don't need that because we have the new RNA or Entresto. That's actually very good medication. How will we treat decompensated heart failure? Same. So decompensated heart failure means patient having congestion. So most of the time you start with ACE inhibitor and then start the patient with frusemide for congestion. If frusemide doesn't lower down the congestion, then you can start the patient with a spironolactone. No need of memorizing the doses. Okay, for AMC, dose doesn't come in exam. So you don't need to remember it. Just the medication name. Moving on to our next chapter, which is valvular heart disease. Valvular heart disease, you all know that murmur is a pain in the ass, and it is also very difficult to remember all those murmur, right? Now, I will show you a trick, especially the one that's actually come in the exam. If you can remember in that way, then it becomes very easy. But you will have to memorize these murmur types. Okay, so what is murmur? Murmur is increased flow of blood through those valves. You have got four valves, right? So you have got tricuspid valve, 
you have got pulmonary valve, mitral valve, and the aortic valve, right? In case of valvular heart disease, either the valve can become narrowed, that is what we call as a stenosis, or your valve is supposed to be a one-way valve. That means it is supposed to prevent any regurgitation of blood from the ventricle to the atrium. Now, if the valve stop working, then easily regurgitation of blood can happen. And that is what we call as regurgitation, which means in case of tricuspid valve, patient can have tricuspid stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation. Same with every other valve, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary regurgitation, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation. So these are the main valvular heart disease that comes in exam. Now, very easy. I have never seen anything from tricuspid coming in exam, so even not from pulmonary. So if you can remember at least the four murmur from this mitral and aortic valve, that should be enough for your exam. Okay? Now, have a look. Just remember one first. That's your mitral stenosis murmur, which is the most common one. Mitral stenosis murmur is mid-diastolic murmur, and mitral, mitral valve is on your fifth intercostal space, right? So if you remember your heart anatomy and everything, so let's say this is second intercostal space and that's the left and that's the right side. Third, fourth, fifth. So that's basically the heart, right? So the apex of the heart is on the fifth, left fifth intercostal space, okay? So this apex is the site for mitral valve. Now, same mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, this fifth intercostal space is usually the area of the mitral valve. Where is the aortic valve? If you see here, the aortic valve, it starts from the left side, but it actually comes to the right a little bit, right? And then it goes like this. That's why you get the aortic stenosis murmur in the right side, usually over here. And that's your right second intercostal space. So that's your murmur for aortic stenosis. But Aortic regurgitation, the valve is over here. That means on the left side. That's why the aortic regurgitation murmur is usually we find along the external border. So this is the external border. Usually along the left fourth intercostal space, just along your sternal ace. You can see that easily you can understand by the location of it, right? It's not very confusing. And the others like pulmonary one, so pulmonary you can see that this actually goes to the left, right? Like this. That's why pulmonary murmur usually best heard in the left second intercostal space. Is this understandable for everyone? Great. It will make it really easy if you can understand why this positioning happens. Now come back to the mitral stenosis murmur. Okay. So if you want me to repeat, so first of all, mitral valve is on the apex. So where is your apex? Left fifth intercostal space. So mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, it will be over here on the left fourth left fifth intercostal space. Then coming to the aorta, aortic stenosis murmur, because aorta comes from the left side and goes to the right, okay? So aortic stenosis murmur is best heard on the right second intercostal space. 
but the aortic regurgitation murmur because the valve is here and it's still on the left side. So aortic regurgitation murmur is based hard on the left fourth intercostal space along the external edge. Whereas pulmonary valve, so the pulmonary artery goes to the right like this. That's why pulmonary murmur based hard on the left second intercostal space. Now it's clear. Good, very good. Now, come back to the mitral stenosis. You just remember the mitral stenosis murmur. Mitral stenosis murmur is called mid diastolic murmur, based hard in the apex, which means left fifth intercostal space. Now, for the purpose of it, this is just to remember, it's not any process or anything like that. In, when you find mitral stenosis, just think what is the opposite of it. We will think opposite of mitral is aorta and opposite of stenosis is regurgitation. So that's how we remember it. There is nothing like opposite. So if mitral stenosis is diastolic murmur, what's the opposite of mitral stenosis? M, we have got aortic regurgitation, right? Aortic regurgitation, also a diastolic murmur. But it's early diastolic murmur. Now, it's very easy if you remember it. You just need to remember only this one. Now, what are the other two left from mitral and aortic? We have got mitral stenosis. So mitral regurgitation is left. And aortic regurgitation we have found, we have aortic stenosis left. These two are systolic murmur. What is aortic stenosis? It's the ejection systolic murmur. What is mitral? It's called pan-systolic or holosystolic murmur. Both of these two murmur radiates. Mitral regurgitation radiates to axilla. Aortic stenosis radiates to carotid or neck. See that if you can remember mitral stenosis murmur, you can remember all the three. Is this clear for everyone? Did you actually understand how I came across it? Because I, I did not remember anything. I just remember this MDM, mid diastolic murmur, and all other murmur, which actually very important for exam. I can easily, easily find it out. It's not actually complicated if you really understand it. The memorizing this murmur is much more complicated and you can easily forget in the exam, okay? If you can memorize it, then it's totally fine. You don't need to even think about it. But if you are someone who can get confused in the exam, this is the way at least you will be sure when you are choosing the, the murmur in the exam, you can easily just find out that if you are choosing it right or wrong, okay? So all of this murmur we have written in here. So aortic stenosis murmur, it's ejection systolic murmur in the right second intercostal space. Mitral regurgitation murmur, it's a hollow systolic murmur radiating to axilla. Then aortic regurgitation, it's an early diastolic murmur. Mitral stenosis, mid diastolic murmur. So you have to memorize this murmur because it comes in exam and it's a very important as well. So please try to memorize it. I would say that we don't need to memorize it because if we can at least know these four, that's more than enough for the exam. And if you can memorize just the mitral stenosis murmur, then if it is very, very easy to remember. I never ever needed to memorize murmur because I easily can find it out, okay? The med bullets, if we go to med bullets, you should be able to find out all the 
valvular heart disease. So this is made bullets guideline. So if you go to this made bullets, all the heart valves problem like mitral valve stenosis, everything is written in here very clearly. So go through the made bullets, you should be able to know, know more about this. Do we need to memorize the characteristic of the mama? It's a good idea to memorize it, but most yeah. of the time they don't make it that much complicated. They just ask you that, is it a ejection systolic murmur, early diastolic murmur, those ones. If you just memorize that, it should be okay. All right, so that's all that we need for valvular heart disease, just the murmur, nothing else. Okay, let's take a five minute break guys. And after that, we will move on to some other, other heart related conditions and that are on hypertension and some other randoms, okay? So five minute break guys, thank you.
All right, everyone, let's start again. Okay, so, so far we got an idea about the heart failures and everything. Going to cardiomyopathies, there are three kinds of cardiomyopathy. You need to just have some basic idea on it, especially dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy known as HOCAM. These two are important for exam. The other one is called restrictive cardiomyopathy. So dilated cardiomyopathy, the name already says that what's actually happening in here, that means the heart muscle can get dilated. So if your heart muscle get dilated, what will happen to the heart condition? So if heart is more dilated, it means it cannot contract properly. That's the pathophysiology of what kind of heart failure? systolic heart failure, right? So this patient who has uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, they actually have systolic heart failure symptoms, okay? So all the symptoms of heart failure, this patient will have. What are the causes of DCM? The cause most of the time we don't know, that's idiopathic. Alcohol is another cause. Sometimes it could be myocarditis, toxin related, some medication can cause it or sometimes some metabolic disorders. Treatment, the same treatment as you do in a systolic heart failure patient, this patient also will get the same. That means ACE inhibitors, beta blocker, fusamide, spironolactone, those will be your main treatment. If you do ejection fraction in this patient, what will happen? Ejection fraction will be less than 35 because this patient has got systolic heart failure. You can easily find out that this is the normal left ventricle, and you can see in dilated cardiomyopathy how big it is. And it actually also, you can see that this is the muscle thickness, and when it gets dilated, the muscle thickness also gets smaller, and it loses its strength in that way. Next is HOCAM or HOCM. So hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is very important topic for exam. So what happens in this case, you can understand there is hypertrophy of cardiac muscle and that's causing obstruction of what? It's causing obstruction of the cardiac output or cardiac outflow. This HOCM can happen without any reason, but in 60% cases, it is hereditary and it has a autosomal dominant inheritance. The distinctive hallmark of this condition is myocardial hypertrophy, especially the interventricular septum. As a result of the hypertrophy, left ventricular compliance is reduced, but the systolic performance is normal. So in this case, what happens, if you look on this slide, this is the normal heart, and that's the intra, interventricular septum, which separates the two ventricles. If you look on this side, this is only the part of your heart. So the heart is very small now, and you can see how much hypertrophic the interventricular septum has become, and also the whole left ventricle. What happens when it, it's like that? Because it's more muscle hypertrophy, there is lack of, lack of space for the heart. So what will not happen? Heart cannot relax. If heart cannot relax, what kind of heart failure you will get in this patient? Diastolic heart failure. See that you can, now you can relate everything. Brilliant. Okay, so in diastolic heart failure, Ejection fraction will be normal. What you can see over here, see that this is the aortic valve. The hypertrophic left ventricle, and because of this hypertrophy, this is also causing obstruction of outflow of blood from the left ventricle into the aorta, right? So that's why we call it hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now, if you see that the heart muscle is this much bigger, 
and the space is very minimal, what will happen to the contractility? Sometimes the contraction becomes hypercontraction and ejection fraction becomes usually more than normal. So sometimes ejection fraction becomes 80 to 90%, okay? So that's one of the other finding that you can get in this patient. So heart becomes hypercontractile and the systole happens with a striking rapidity because the muscle is very strong in here. So what you can do to save the heart? Same that you would do in a diastolic heart failure patient. If you can lower down the heart rate, heart will get a little bit of time to get the blood feeling. So in this case, the treatment of choice will be the beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, just like diastolic heart failure. The clinical manifestation will be same like any heart failure patients, but other finding you can get that we call it bifid carotid pulse. You can also get some murmur, especially mitral regurgitation murmur in these patients, especially sometimes this murmur Sometimes this, live, the, this hypertrophic septum can also impair the mitral valve and you can get a mitral regurgitation marble. Okay. Sudden death can be the first manifestation. A lot of time in HOCM, you can get a family history of sudden cardiac death in a very young age. That's one of the clues. If you do ECG in this patient, you will get left ventricular hypertrophy. That's understandable because we can already see left ventricle is hypertrophic. So in the ECG, you will get it. And if you do an echocardiogram, that will be able to confirm the diagnosis. Now, again, the same thing. You will always start with the ECG first. Even though ECG will not be able to confirm your diagnosis, that's the first investigation. Then most appropriate is echocardiogram. The other thing is that if you do a resting echocardiogram, sometimes it can become normal. If you are highly suspicious of HOCM, then you can send the patient for a stress echocardiogram. While patient will run on the treadmill, you will do an echocardiogram. When you do exercise, sometimes the Hocum clinical manifestation can become much higher and sometimes the findings on the echocardiogram can become more visible. So if resting echo is normal, you are still suspicious, your last thing that you can do is a stress echocardiogram. Okay, but this is the only way to diagnose this patient. If you can't diagnose, you can't treat the patient. So it will be in a tertiary area, that means in the hospital area, we will be doing this stress echocardiogram. Okay, but it has to be done. Restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is a condition and it's the least common cardiomyopathy. In this case, the left ventricle becomes rigid. If the left ventricle becomes rigid, that means it cannot relax properly, right? If it cannot relax properly, what will happen? Diastolic heart failure. Now, if it is rigid, it cannot also contract properly. That means it also has systolic heart failure. So this is a patient who will get both systolic and diastolic heart failure because the myocardium is not able to move like a normal myocardium. So if it cannot move, it cannot relax, nor it can contract. So both diastolic and systolic heart failure can be found. That's why there is no good medical treatment for this patient. Usually the death happens from heart failure or arrhythmia. The only treatment is heart transplantation. So far clear everyone about the cardiomyopathies.
Great. Moving on to acute pericarditis or pericardial causes. Acute pericarditis is a inflammation of pericardium, and you know that pericardium is the outer lining of your heart, right? So acute pericarditis in the, is the inflammation of the pericardial lining. And you remember, we told that how it presents. So initially, patient might have some flu-like illness, followed by a left-sided chest pain, and it gets worse by lying down, by coughing or deep breathing. And it gets better in sitting forward or leading or leaning forward. If you do the examination or auscultation, you can get a pericardial friction rub. Sometimes in the questions say that when you auscult it, you can hear a noise in the heart or in the precordium. So in the if you get a noise or a friction rub on auscultation, that's also characteristic for pericarditis. The common causes are viral infection, idiopathic, sometimes connective tissue disorders. It could be related to metabolic disorders like uremia, could be trauma, neoplasm, or any metabolic disorders. Diagnosis is ECG. If you do the ECG and you get a global ST segment elevation in all the leads, then we can think about pericarditis. When we do the ECG class, we will show you the ECG and discuss it. Treatment. Treatment is mainly finding out its cause. If it is idiopathic, then treat with anti-inflammatory like any NSAIDs. You can also add colchicine that will also improve the pain. Sometimes a steroid can be given as well. But usually NSAID is the first line of choice. So that was pericarditis. Pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion is another condition. So some questions, so tuberculosis or viral infection, the most common cause of pericarditis. Viral infection. TB is very rare in Australia. I would never think tuberculosis as my first diagnosis in Australia, unless patient recently came from overseas, that's very, very less likely. Now, how colchicine affects pericarditis? Colchicine is a, is a thing which also acts as an anti-inflammatory agent. Like in gout, you use colchicine. Why? Because it's, it acts as an anti-inflammatory agent. Okay. Same happens in pericarditis. Pericardial effusion. So if there is fluid accumulation in the pericardium, now ha have a look. This is the heart. And that's your pericardium or the outer covering, right? Normally, there should not be any fluid in here. But if the fluid accumulated in this space, what can happen? If there is more and more fluid accumulation, it can affect the heart relaxation. And it can cause heart failure also sometimes. But more importantly, it will restrict the pumping or relaxation of the heart which will affect everything. Now, fluid may accumulate in the pericardial cavity in virtually any form of pericardial disease. So someone who has got pericarditis, they can get pericardial effusion. Same like any effusion, it can be transudate or exudates. Do we need to know this much? No. Especially, we just need to know how to diagnose pericardial effusion. If you do an echocardiogram, that will confirm if the patient has pericardial effusion or not. If you do a chest X-ray, you will get a water bottle configuration of cardiac shadow. Looks like this. You can see that how big the cardiac shadow is, and it looks like a water bottle. That's pericardial effusion. Now, the concern is not just pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion means that having a fluid accumulation outside of the heart. But if by any chance 
the fluid accumulation develops so rapidly that it starts to compress the heart. That's life threatening. And that is what we call as cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade, mainly it will cause heart failure symptom because heart is now not able to relax and it cannot have enough blood in. Because of that, patient will have features of heart failure, including shortness of breath, fatigue, orthopnea. You can get pulses paradoxes, like a decrease in systolic blood pressure, more than 10 with normal inspiration. You can also get all the features of heart failure, especially JBP will be elevated. The heart sound will become muffled. The classic triad we call is Beck's triad. And Beck's triad means hypotension, distended neck vein, and decreased or muffled heart sound. Why there is muffled heart sound? Because you can understand now that there is lots of fluid accumulated outside the heart. Because of that, you will not be able to hear the heart, heart sound properly. So that's muffled or decreased heart sound. Because your heart is now not able to feel properly, it's not contracting properly as well. There will be fluid accumulation and fluid will be accumulated in the, in the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. So all the heart failure feature will start and you will get a raised JPP. Okay, so if you get a patient who has got a classic triad of hypotension, distended neck vein and decreased heart sound, we can confirm that this patient has got cardiac tamponade. What will you do to confirm cardiac tamponade? A bedside echocardiogram should be arranged urgently, followed by you can do a pericardiosynthesis, which means just like pneumothorax, in pericardiosynthesis, you will insert a white bore cannula or white bore needle inside the pericardium and aspirate all the fluid. So that's pericardiosynthesis is the treatment of choice. Is this clear for everyone? Good. Now, coming to constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis, it's a diffuse thickening of the pericardium in response to some form of inflammation. So what happens in constrictive pericarditis? So when your heart relax, everything relax, right? The pericardium also relax. Now, if your heart is fine, but pericardium is very rigid and thickened, it cannot allow your heart to relax. Same like cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis will also cause the same symptom which means in this case, patient cardiac output will be limited because there, there is reduced distensibility of the cardiac chamber. That means heart cannot distend properly. So feeling is reduced. Same, the cardiac output is also reduced. The fundamental abnormality is abnormal diastolic feeling causing diastolic heart failure. The symptoms will be same of heart failure Okay, and there is a classic chest X-ray finding, which we call X on shell, because there is basically a calcification of the pericardium. See this white line around the heart? You will never see it in any patient except pericarditis, like constricting pericarditis. This is actually calcium deposition that's causing this problem. And that's X on shell, gives you the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. So that's all about what we have done. Any questions so far, guys? If not, we will take a two minute break before we move on to hypertension, because you need to clear your head before we can go through that because hypertension is not that much interesting like what we have done so far.
Let's take a two minute break and then we come again for hypertension. Thank you. Okay, guys, so let's start again. Hopefully your brain is now again blank, okay? All right, so we're starting with hypertension, but before that, you guys have some questions. So difference between pericardiosynthesis and pericardial window. So synthesis, you understand, I hope. Pericardial window is another process for this tamponade in which they actually just remove a small part of that pericardial sac and they drain the fluid. It can be done as well in tamponade. Treatment of constrictive pericarditis, same or like any diastolic heart failure, because it's the mainly a diastolic heart failure is the main symptom for this, you treat it as diastolic heart failure. Okay, for hypertension, the chapter that we follow from John Motor is chapter 77. Hypertension, you need to just get a basic idea, especially how to treat hypertension. It's not like everyone who comes with blood pressure, you will start them with medication. In that way, everyone in Australia will have a hypertensive medication, okay? So that's not the ideal way to treat a patient. And there is some guideline that we follow before starting these medications. So the normal blood pressure is Usually we say below 130 by 80. Diastolic can go up to 85, that's fine. We have divided the blood pressure into mild, moderate, severe. Mild is systolic up to 159, diastolic up to 99. Then there is moderate and severe. Severe is more than 180 by 110. We say that for any adult aged 18 and above, Hypertension is repeated measurement of diastolic heart failure, diastolic pressure more than 90 and systolic more than 140. So if you want to say that this patient has got hypertension, you can't just have one reading and confirm the diagnosis of it. If they have more than 140 by 90, okay, on, multi, on at least two separate occasions, then you can diagnose them as hypertension. Okay, 
Now, if there is only one is elevated, like patient has got, let's say 150 by 70. Is it hypertension? Yes, Any, anyone, either systolic or diastolic, if it is elevated, that will be hypertension. Now, causes of hypertension, 95% cases, there is no cause, it's just how it is. So essential hypertension, where we can't find out any cause of it. Secondary hypertension can be due to a lot of causes. Most importantly, kidney related, like it could be renal artery stenosis, glomerulonephritis, polycystic kidney disease, endocrine, like on syndrome, Cushing syndrome, pheochromocytoma, oral contraceptive pill can do it, quartation of aorta, some drugs, especially steroid. So these are the secondary causes of hypertension that we are supposed to rule out. There are some specific clinical feature which can be a clue in your exam. And then you should think about possibility of secondary hypertension. Like if the question says that there is a abdominal brewing, especially the, if they say renal brewing, that's renal artery stenosis. If a patient having RBC cast with proteinuria hematuria, likely glomerulonephritis. If a patient has got bilateral kidney enlargement and having a family history of polycystic kidney disease, think about PCKD. If a patient has got delayed femoral pulse, which we call radiofemoral DLA, think about coarctation of aorta. Especially if a patient has got obesity, snoring at night, and daytime tiredness, sleepiness, it could be obstructive sleep apnea. If a patient has got episodes of hypertension, headache, pallor, sweating and palpitation, think about pheochromocytoma. So these are the common ones that we would like to rule out in such patients. So the physical examination can help, especially if you have got a renal brewery or epigastric brewery. We always think about kidney artery stenosis. If you have got abdominal mass, especially mass in the flank, think about polycystic kidney. A delayed femoral pulse, coarctation, and then tachycardia, sweating, pallor with hypertension, pheochromocytoma. What is malignant hypertension? If someone has got diastolic pressure more than 120 and having some vasculopathy like retinopathy, nephropathy, that's malignant hypertension. What is refractory hypertension? Someone having hypertension, despite you have tried maximum dose of two drugs for three to four months. And this is one of the important things. If you have got a patient who is young and having refractory hypertension, you should try to look for any secondary cause of hypertension. Okay, there is always a risk that patient can have a secondary hypertension in such case. Renal artery stenosis. So renal artery stenosis, most of the time it happens because of atherosclerotic plaques. So that means someone who has got history of smoking, hypercholesterolemia, or ischemic heart disease, they are more risky to have renal artery stenosis by this atherosclerosis. If it is a young patient and you can get renal brewing, there is another condition can cause this, which we call fibromuscular dysplasia. We should think about renal artery stenosis if a patient having refractory hypertension, you have tried two drugs with maximum dose, still you can't bring it down. Do a Doppler ultrasound of the renal artery to rule out this possibility. Okay, and Doppler ultrasound is the specific investigation for this. For renal artery stenosis, the guideline is, if it is a single renal artery stenosis, the choice of antihypertensive is ACE inhibitor, 
or ARP, angiotensin receptor blocker. If it is bilateral renal artery stenosis, you can't use ACE or ARB that's contraindicated. In this situation, calcium channel blocker will be your first choice. So that comes in exam. Just please try to remember unilateral renal artery stenosis, ACE inhibitor or ARB is the choice. Bilateral renal artery stenosis, the choice is CCB. Now coming to diagnosis of hypertension, if you get a patient who has been, who you think might have hypertension, you have to repeat it. So diagnosis should not be made on the base of a single visit. At least two other visits within the space of three months, you have to check the blood pressure. It is recommended to check blood pressure of everyone above 18 every two yearly at least. Okay, that's a screening test we would do. Now, this table is important. It comes in exam. How to manage a hypertensive patient and how we do the follow-up. If a patient having high normal hypertension, you ask the patient to do some lifestyle modification and you repeat the blood pressure in a year time. If it is grade one hypertension, confirm hypertension by two other repeat blood pressure in the next two months and ask the patient to follow lifestyle modification. That means still you are not starting medication straight away, even it's one up to 159. If it is grade two, then you need to evaluate the patient within another month with lifestyle advice. Now we will come to the, like when we start the medication, just in a bit, this is actually how we do the follow-up. If it is more than 180 by 110, idea is to refer or at least evaluate within a week time if you have got a patient who has got severe hypertension, and if you can confirm it with multiple reading at the same time, you can start the medication straight away. There is no need of waiting. If you have got mild hypertension, observation with repeat measurement over three to six months should be followed before beginning therapy. So that's ideal that if it is a case of mild hypertension, we will not start with blood pressure medication straight away. We will give them time, some lifestyle modification to see that if the blood pressure can come down. Let's just come to the management a little bit because now we are discussing about that. How we actually treat this patient. Let's say on several occasions, patient was diagnosed with high blood pressure. There is nothing important than lifestyle changes, so that's always there. You do this five-yearly cardiovascular risk. Remember the five-yearly risk that we have done in our trial session? If, if it is low risk, like less than 10%, we will not try medication straight away. Lifestyle for six months at least. We will only consider starting the treatment if blood pressure persistently more than 150 by 95. Okay? If it is moderate risk, at least three months of lifestyle change, consider drug treatment if blood pressure remains more than 140 by 90. High risk patient who has target organ disease like retinopathy, nephropathy, or Aboriginal tourist straight groups, begin drug treatment immediately. That means in high risk group, you should start the treatment immediately if it is between moderate to severe hypertension. Okay, usually if it is a mild hypertension, everyone, we will try lifestyle modification first. In case of moderate to severe hypertension, this is the one that we will follow, this five-yearly risk factor. 
Okay, so based on the five yearly risk factor, we will see that how long we can do the lifestyle change and when to, re when to start the medication. Is this clear for everyone? The thing is that if the patient is young, the risk of having a cardiovascular event will be low anyway. So you will always see that like a 30 year old who has hypertension, they will not be severe or high risk, very unlikely based on their age. That's how the, the that chart is arranged, okay? Now, there is a term called ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. This is not halter monitor. Remember that it is totally different. So it's a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor in which a device will be attached to the patient's arm for 24 hours, and it will continuously check the blood pressure whenever a patient is sleeping or doing any job. So at a specific time, it will check the blood pressure for 24 hours. Why we do it? If you think your patient has got a white coat hypertension, that means during GP clinic or during the clinic visit, his blood pressure is very high, but when he goes home, his blood pressure is normal. In that case, you do the 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor to confirm it. And let's say at one time, the blood pressure was 160 by 90, then Next day, or two, two to three days later, patient again came and blood pressure is 120 by 60. When there is a marked variability of office BP, we should also do this ambulatory blood pressure monitor. If you have tried two drug as a maximum dose, that means it's a resistant hypertension, again, we can do an ambulatory monitor. Okay, so these are the main indications to do this ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Now about the lifestyle measures, what are the lifestyle measures we actually ask the patient to do? The most important thing is to reduce the weight. Even if they can reduce one kilo weight, blood pressure will drop by 2.5. So that's very important that the first thing that we talk about is weight reduction, followed by reduction of excess alcohol. Salt intake should be reduced. And some others like smoking, dietary factors, those are there. Medication, which is the most important part. How we start medication for hypertension. Once we decide that we are going to start medication, the first line medication, especially if patient is more than 55, is ACE inhibitor or ARB, always. If we don't use the ACE, then the second line is calcium channel blocker, especially if the patient is very elderly, like above 65, then hyaluronic diuretics can be your choice. But the first line is always ACE or ARB if we can. If you start ACE inhibitor and next month patient comes to you, still you see high blood pressure. Will you just increase the dose of blood pressure medication or add a new one? No. You will wait for at least three months to see that if this medication can do something. If it still is not in the target value, that means not less than 140 by 90, then you can combine. So with ACE, you can add another calcium channel blocker. With ACE, you can add hyaluronic diuretics. With ACE, you can add beta blocker. After three months, still target not reached, you can do triple medication, ACE, CCB, and thiazide. Okay, so that's the step-by-step -step approach. We should not use few combination, especially beta blocker and calcium channel blocker should not be used together or hypertension, because both will reduce the heart rate. Patient can have heart block or heart failure. We should be cautious when we use ACE or ARB with spironolactone because it can cause hyperkalemia. 
both A's and ARB should not be given together because more or less the same thing. Okay. Less than 50, again, ACE inhibitor will be your first choice. So ACE is usually the first choice unless ACE is contraindicated. Now, there are some medical comorbidities in which we choose some specific antihypertensive and we have some preference. Especially if a patient has got asthma COPD, we should not use beta blocker because it can cause bronchoconstriction. All other medications can be used. Same with someone who has got heart block or bradycardia, we should not use something which can lower down their heart rate. That means calcium channel blocker and beta blocker should not be used. In heart failure patient, ACE inhibitor is our first choice. But we should be careful, especially if it is a systolic heart failure, we should be careful when you use calcium channel or beta blocker. Diabetes, ACE inhibitor is a very good antihypertensive. Try not to use thiazide diuretics in this patient. Same with dyslipidemia, same with hyperuricemia. Peripheral vascular disease. In peripheral vascular disease, already there is vasoconstriction. You can't use anything which causes more vasoconstriction. So you should not use beta blocker. So what we can use? The best will be something which can cause vasodilation, which is calcium channel blocker. So for PVD with hypertension, calcium channel blocker will be an ideal medication. Kidney artery stenosis, we already discussed. Kidney failure, it depends what is the stage of kidney failure. Up to a stage three kidney failure, you can use ACE inhibitor or ARB. But when it becomes, the GFR becomes less than 30 or the kidney failure is much worse or in this stage, then ACE inhibitor or ARB is not ideal. In that situation, calcium channel blocker will be your choice. Okay, so that's most of the thing that actually comes from hypertension. Do you guys have any question? Is there any age limit for CCB? No. We prefer CCB for more elderly patient, especially above 50, but there is no age limit for it. First choice is always ACE inhibitor, Dr. Shyam, okay? If it is a, we, we say that if it is a Afro-Caribbean patient and above 65, for them, thiazide diuretics will be the choice. But except then, the others usually ACE inhibitor. For peripheral vascular disease, Calcium general blocker is the first choice because it can cause vasodilation. Okay, so that's all about hypertension. Now, the only chapter we are left with is palpitation, which is chapter 70 in John Mutta. We do palpitation chapter in our ECG class because it's, it's the same thing and we cover ECG with palpitation at the same time. So it will be part of your ECG class, but ECG is not a part of our two week session. After two weeks, we will have that class with our course students, okay? So that's all about cardiology, guys. Was it very difficult? Did you actually get some information that, that will be helpful for your life at least? I hope that it cleared a lot of confusion that you might have. And cardiology is, is one of the best thing because you can always find out why it's occurring. And that's that what amazes everyone. And you don't need to memorize a lot of things.
these topics are more than enough for exam. Okay. Any of you has any questions, you can also unmute yourself and ask about the course, or if you have anything that you want to discuss. We, we already discussed the course details throughout these two week sessions. We don't need to do it every day. If you have any questions, I can always answer. And if you have enrolled today, Dr. Melania, we might not have added you into the Facebook course group. So just send me a message that um, I have paid today. Can you please add me to the Facebook course group and also the software? Then our team member will add you in the poll. And Dr. Sumia, okay, I will have a look, okay? I don't know that why it was not answered yet. We'll see. Dr. Jinat, I asked you to send a message in my messenger. I haven't found your message. And I can't also find your Facebook ID. That's why I could not help you. Dr. Noshin, I could find her and I have tagged her into the PDF book section and she found it. So it's there in your Facebook group. Can you just now send me a message with your Facebook group, Facebook ID? Yes, you should do the blue book simultaneously. At least finish twice the handbook. There are lots of outdated answers there, but still it will give you a good idea about how the questions come in the exam and everyone actually goes through it. It's, it's a kind of like, you have to do it. So at least just read it twice. Some people do more, but two times is more than enough. Dr. Gina, can you just do it now? And what's your Facebook ID name? See that that's why I did not know that you were, because you were using Gina here and your Facebook name is different. So I could not find you, or I did not even know that this is you. Okay, so that's fine. Just send a message right now. I will tag you into the Facebook group where we have given the books. Infective endocarditis is a part of infectious disease, not the cardiologizations. And again, for Dr. Minal, if you are a Facebook group member, the books are there. Just go to the featured section of that group. In the featured section, the book is there. You will get like PDF of all books that you need. Something like that it is written. There is a Google link there. If you just open that Google link, you should get all the books. It's there because I have tagged a few people just recently. Likely chance that you are not going into the featured section. That's why you are not getting it. Just click the featured section, you should be able to get it. Next session. So, Dr. Melania, we have given the two weeks free session the class schedule. If you have a look, it should be there. Just let me see if I can show you. So, if you go to the our official group, then in the feature section, should be able to get all the, so this was our first two weeks schedule. You can see that these are the schedule given, just follow these times. So there will be another class tomorrow as well. Tomorrow class will be taken by Dr. Rabia and she will mainly go through some of the recent question solvation. Then there is another on 13th and 14th, same Zoom ID and password like today, okay? Okay, and Dr. Sadia, where I can find John Murtag 8? 
John Mutag Eight is also in the in the Facebook group. I'm not quite sure about that part. I will have a look that if it is not in our in that PDF sections of the group. So this is not the group I am talking about. This is official. There is another group for just the course students. In that one, if you go to the featured part, just like this one, should be able to get a PDF link of all books. See that if the John Mutag is there. If not, then we will just upload one for you. It should be fine. The John Mutag is useful. Yes, Dr. Stewart. And it should be the big one. Okay, so there it's a big book. If you just get the soft copy, most of the time that's fine. If you want to get a hard copy, copy, sometimes, yeah, it is a very big book. Sometimes we get like three, three division of it, and then it can become a little bit less. The book that we should follow is mainly John Murta, Kaplan Step to CK book. And based on sometimes we go for some websites that we discussed in our first class, like the first trial class that we had, we discussed that. You are a part of the course, Dr. E. Stewart. I, we will discuss those things again in our orientation class. You should, we should go through that in detail at that time as well. Do you have any pays other than first aid AMC MCQ? Not any pays. We have some other groups like for clinical, for pesky. There is a Facebook page as well, but that's not an active page. We always, if you send a message to the page, we ask you to send a message to our, our messenger group, or we ask you to send the email. So there is a page, but it's not very active. The active one is this Facebook group. Dr. Nimra, the cardiology lecture, it's, it's in the portal. Are you, I think you are already added in the course, right? If you are added, then it should be in the, in the portal, in the portal, in the theory section of the portal, it's there. And cardiology lecture one, lecture two, these are all there. And Dr. Shayan, for the first two weeks, the Zoom ID and password is same, just like how we are doing. Okay, so that's it. Thank you, everyone. We'll again see you tomorrow. I might not be able to come tomorrow. Dr. Dr. Rabia is, she has been taking class for a long time. She has done done these classes before. So you will be with her tomorrow, and I hope that you would like her approach as well. And if any of you who has already paid for the course, but you haven't been added to our course group in Facebook, or you haven't been added to our portal, please send us a message in the messenger or in the email. Now, again, because we are adding everyone at the same time, it can take a little bit of time. So just keep your patience. If you're waiting for, let's say, three, four days, then you can again send an email to us. We will obviously look into that. Okay, but it usually doesn't happen immediately because we need to go through your, your details and everything. And it takes, at this time, we even sometimes one week. That's why we say that if you are interested to join the course, start the process of enrollment so that by the time we start it fully, you are already added everywhere. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tabiba. The portal is very well organized that I can assure you, like everyone, there is nothing you need if you have the portal. And that's, that's usually we say always that it has everything that you need. If you do the live sessions or the live classes and then just follow what we are saying to you, there is no way you can fail the exam. But again, you have to do your hard work as well. You can't just, just sit and think that, well, Dr. Ashan will finish everything and I will, I will not do anything else by myself. That will not work. 
you have to do your own hard work. And then if you do it and with our guidance, it's not hard to pass this exam. Okay, thank you everyone. We will see you again in, in the next few classes. Have a good night. Take care, bye.